Um, my name is Andrea Merriam. Um, I'm with the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Alliance, and it is my joy to be able to host this conversation today. Um, I'll cover some housekeeping items before we get going. We will, uh, we are recording this program, so you'll be able to watch it and share later. Um, we've turned on the ability to have transcripts or closed captions. You can toggle that on or off in the more button in the bottom menu. And I see everyone uh, starting to use the chat function. That's going to be a great way for you to add your comments, add your questions. And um, if, uh, if our guest is up for it, maybe we can do some live questions and have you unmute yourself and, um, you know, say hello um, and, uh, and, to, and chime in um, over video as well if you're up for it. Yes, ma'am. Um, so if anyone has uh, any tech issues, my colleague Kelly here, so say hi, Kelly. She's manning the chat, so if your video or your audio doesn't work or you want to figure out how to save um, a good link that we share in the chat, uh, type a message and she will send you a private note to get it all sorted out. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's all of our housekeeping items. So I'm thrilled to introduce you all, and I bet a lot of people already know the Parkinson's diva, Dr. Maria DeLeon. She's joining us from, uh, from tropical Miami today. And um, the, the format for today's program, we're going to um, be watching a little bit about her story, a portion of the documentary uh, um, created by uh, Iyad Amer and the University of Rochester Parkinson TV team. Um, so Iyad, I, th I think you're on. Do you want to um, say hi and anything you want to share about uh, the film or uh, Chet or Rochester and uh, to get us started? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Thanks. Thanks. Um, sorry, I have both my computers running for the sound there. So, the um, ultimate tech guy. He has multiple devices going. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you guys. Thank you uh, to the chat. Iris uh, did a great job in the documentary. Um, I will say it, it was a joint effort between me, Alistair, and Norm at the uh, chat. And uh, they, they sure love to see replays of, of these events when they can after. And um, it, it's Parkinson TV. And I'll share my screen from the other computer now to discuss the two slide, uh, the two pager. Um, like I always do in these, so share optimize. I'll, uh, this is the documentary's um, kind of like a a uh, two slides describing it. We really wanted for this season, and I'm not sure how many of you guys have seen the first two seasons, to capture the firsthand voices of people like Maria and eleven others. Um, so we we our our kind of theme is twelve extraordinary individuals, one reviving mission. Um, and it's basically them discussing the fundamentals of the book, which are the pact, prevention, advocacy, care, and treatment to end this disease. And within the full uh, documentary, Maria's um, episode or Maria's story fits mostly with care, in this case, as a primary care doctor, as a movement disorder specialist, as someone who's taking care of her um, grandma, and she, who, she diagnosed her own Parkinson's before she got diagnosed herself. And we'll see more of that in the episode. And this is kind of like the origins of the series. This was uh, founded by a collaboration between Dr. Boz uh, Bloom and uh, Dr. Ray Dorsey uh, at the University of Rochester. And uh, for season three, as I said, we have the two uh, lines of, of the, uh, the product. We have the um, full documentary, which I encourage all of you guys to see. It's a one hour long documentary that is the full feature length uh, film and then we also have the episodes that you can watch the rest of at www.parkinsontv.org um, and yeah I can't wait to show this week's episode with Maria in a little bit. Thank you it's a pleasure to have the the filmmaker himself the man behind the camera and the drone bravo to you Iyad. it was such a great documentary. He's awesome they're awesome I had Thank such fun with them. <laughs> 
and Kelly put the link to watch that documentary in the chat and um, the book mentioned is Ending PD. You can put that in the chat as well. Uh, so I'll try to do a quick show of hands. So who has watched the documentary? Has anyone seen it? Okay, Let's see Lauren's seen it and Hetty. Okay, and what about the um, the book Ending Parkinson's Disease? Is that everyone has that on their uh, shelf and it's a favorite? Recommending it to friends? Okay, so that helps me know kind of the context of uh, um, whether you all are insiders or just getting introduced to uh, to this material and the, the film and the book. So very good. Well, let's get started. I think, Iad, you're going to stream the video for us. So we'll all watch it together. And then we get to go behind the scenes and ask questions to Maria um, and uh, both as someone with Parkinson's as a movement disorder specialist, expert physician, um, and a human being, right? <laughs> so let's, uh, let's watch and then um, we'll come back uh, and discuss. I'd move movement disorder. Um, can everybody, everybody hear? Everybody, 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 everybody. Can everybody hear the sound? I'll try playing right now. We did hear Larry. Maria, Maria. Del Yes. Maria De Leon is a certified movement disorder specialist. When I was studying biology, neurobiology at Penn, one of the doctors there had an interest and passion for Parkinson's. And that started me really getting, you know, excited about uh, the brain and Parkinson's and, and doing surgery. So right then and there, I was a sophomore. I told mom, I'm going to be a doctor. Of course, she stopped asking me, what am I going to do the rest of my life? So I knew that I was going to be a neurologist and I went to Queen Square in uh, London to do more training and I knew Parkinson's was my calling. Little did I know that there was going to be more than a calling later on. So, Her interest in Parkinson's disease became personal when she helped to diagnose her grandmother. My grandmother who lived in Mexico, she fell and broke her ankle. One look at her and I knew she had Parkinson's. But very shortly upon her arrival, um, we discovered she had a brain tumor. And that kind of started her decline more uh, because of the tumor than the, than the Parkinson's itself. And within about a year or so, I started to notice that I was having Parkinson's symptoms. Um, being a Parkinson's doctor, which is kind of, you know, uh, ironic, I was doing the usual test for my patients, you know, finger to finger tapping, opening your hands and walking tandem. All of a sudden, I could not do those things. I was looking at myself more than the patients going like, uh, I can't do that, I can't open my, my hand. And I was having trouble driving at nighttime. Um, I would go, you know, to the hospital and call in the middle of the night and I could not judge distance. I was always like, how far is that car? So I finally, after two years of going to every doctor imaginable, Dr. Sheese, who was my really good friend and who's uh, also was my, my mentor, she said, Maria, this is in your brain, but not like you think. You have Parkinson's. And I was like, thank God. I still know my neurology. I knew something was wrong with me. I'm not crazy. But then it was like, you know, what about the pain and what about the vision? We ruled out myasthenia, we ruled out MS, we keep ruling things out, but we haven't found out the cause. And lo and behold, as soon as I started taking my levodopa, uh, the pain eased and some of the vision problems eased some. I was like, oh, I can breathe, I'm feeling better, I'm thinking better, I'm not angry, I'm not irritable, I'm, you know, thinking clearer, I wasn't as fatigued. And then I thought, wait, you know, the, the Parkinson's, this related to Parkinson's, you know, and it started doing research, started remembered a few patients talked about, you know, having um, this kind of visual problems that we can figure out. I started noticing that the medicines made my cycle worse. And then in turn, my cycle made my symptoms worse. So I started asking other women, you know, that, that were still young and were still having cycles, you know, do you notice anything? And then I started thinking, and I saw this um, definition of a diva that said that um, 
doing extraordinary things with the normal capabilities, you know. And so I thought, yes, those Parkinson's patients, you know, they're doing extraordinary things with the limited capabilities they have. But with Parkinson's, what do we do? We always ask people to uh, to speak loud, to, to do big movements. So, you know, divas are loud and not really in an obnoxious way. But that's what started me uh, wanting to write about women. And I, I wrote about the Parkinson's diva, and that's the book that, that started this whole movement of women in PD. As a movement disorder specialist, Maria understands the value of keeping the brain and the body as active as possible. I like learning new things. I like, you know, history. I love history. Um, so I like to travel and see those places, visit those places. Of course, with the epidemic, you know, a pandemic has really put a halt on all that traveling. Uh, I'm a foodie. I love to go and try new things, try, you know, learn new, um, new foods and art. As you can see, I'm very colorful. I love art. I like Van Gogh. I like, you know, um, Dali and things. So what is inside my brain is not what comes out. Okay. So I'm not the painter, the artist that my daughter is. My daughter is an artist in the family. Uh, mine is scribble scrabble. I go walking with my friends. Um, we used to go to the, to the stadium. We had a routine when I drop off my daughter to school, just go and walk around. I like a lot of reading, all kinds of novels, romance to, you know, history, mystery. Mystery is my favorite. Sometimes, you know, medicine is an art as well as a science and it takes time. So what I would say, find the right doctor, the person that listens to you, the person that you connect so that you can have a report and build a report. It takes time to build a relationship. So in actuality, this area is known as the East Texas Belt for Parkinson's, uh, even known in the 23andMe, you know, they've, they've they pinpointed that there is something here. The need that we still have, even in this country, um, for access to care, for affordable care, uh, for equal care, uh, because there's so many patients that, uh, despite all the great strides that we made in the last 20 years and all the new medications we got and the new tools, there's still only a subgroup of people that are taking advantage of those uh, new diagnoses, new treatments, rather new tools. I've seen time and time again with with patients with Acelec, for instance, say that, you know, nine out of 10 times, I was on that medicine, it was great, but I had to stop it because it was so expensive. Don't take no for an answer and, and apply for what you need, for what you want. Demand more access to treatments and wellness activities for all people with Parkinson's disease. And so don't ever think that, you know, you're being uh, given a bad hand or that, you know, you're losing something because, in fact, I think you were all gaining something by this, uh, something positive if we learn how to value what is given to us and, and take advantage of it. Dr. De Leon is a gift to the Parkinson's community. She gives us a valuable perspective on what it's like to have Parkinson's disease as a woman and as a physician. Even though she's a neurologist and trained at one of the top uh, training programs in the entire world at Queen Square in England, she developed Parkinson's disease herself. So if you're a woman and you have Parkinson's disease and you're not getting your questions answered from your male neurologist or even from your female neurologist, she's provided a valuable book and guide to all women with Parkinson's disease so you can understand how Parkinson's disease affects women and how it affects women differently than it does many men. Bravo, brava to the diva. <laughs> well, so much to, uh, so much to dive into. I wanted to start so uh, as Dr. Dorsey pointed out, so Penn, Queen Square, you trained at some, you know, really prestigious institutions. Um, you know, how did you, uh, did, w were there other physicians in the family? Were you the first physician? Can you tell us about how you got started in medicine? Yeah, it, it's it's funny because um, I have some relatives are physicians and growing up, my mom was a nurse in Mexico. And so she would always say that she wanted me to be a physician. And I was like, no, I do not want to be a doctor. I do not, you know, like blood and all of that. So I was always against it. Um, and it was funny, I guess it was in my cards, my calling when I went to, I was always into the brain, neurobiology was my major and was always interested in the way the, the mom 
mind and brain connection and the behavior and things. Uh, and I remember, you know, learning about the, you know, dopamine and the, and the pathways and things like that. So I was always very intrigued by all that. Um, but as I said, my, one of my core um, professors that was, you know, in neurobiology had an interest. So at the time, uh, he would talk about the, um, the deep brain uh, surgeries that we're doing at the time, fetal uh, transplantations for, for Parkinson's. And that got me very interested and excited that I knew that that's something that I wanted to do. So I knew right in there that I wanted to become a doctor and I wanted to be, initially I wanted to be a neurosurgeon because I wanted uh, to do the surgeries. But what I realized when I started medical school is that I'm too much of a people person and I like to you know actually get to know the patients, get to know them and, and help them, the families. and uh, although I would have been working with Parkinson's as a surgeon, I really like just working day to day with people with this uh, disorder, besides other neurological diseases, but Parkinson's always had a special calling for me. And so that's how, you know, I decided that neurology was my, my thing, my calling. And um, I made sure that I spent time with all the experts at the time that I knew that were doing movement disorders and working with Parkinson's so that I can get the best, um, you know, up-to-date information and, and the, um, the new theories and diagnosis and treatments. So I just was very blessed. And I was blessed that uh, God always put the right people in front of me so that I can, you know, pursue this career. And like I said, little did I know that it was going to become not just my passion, but an actual, you know, uh, cross to bear. But the best thing that's ever happened to me, believe it or not. So you took your work home with you. I think yes, I, I did. Say. And you, in the documentary, that, you know, diagnosis conundrum, you know, trying to figure out the symptoms and, and uh, all of the question marks and ruling out MS, ruling out this and that. Um, how old were you? Because you look very young and beautiful. You were young. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I was in my, I was in my, I was 34 when I first started noticing symptoms. And actually now with hindsight, I can tell that I was having symptoms in residency, you know, when I was in my 20s. Uh, but, you know, I was too busy being a doctor and didn't really uh, realize the visual problems that was one of the big things that I began to notice in my 30s. Uh, was the distance, the perception um, that was more pronounced at nighttime. But I remember, uh, and this was something that people always made fun of me when I was doing my residency because I already had a visual field defect at that time that I wasn't really fully aware of that because I could still drive and do everything else. But it always came through when I was writing my notes uh, I would always start kind of in the middle of the page uh, with my nose and everybody was like, why don't you ever start at the edge? I'm like, well, I don't know. I just would see the edge right there. So that's what I was started, but never really occurred to me that I was having a visual field effect because all my eye exams and I could see fine. And so never really, but now with, you know, 10 years forward and I was having trouble parking between two cars, parking my car in the garage because I had such pronounced visual field defect on that side. Uh, that I could not judge where, you know, uh, the distance was. And, and so I had a hard time. So looking back, yes, I've had it for a long time. Uh, as we say, you know, 10 to 15 years before you actually get diagnosed. And so vision was one of the biggest problems. And then pain, uh, I had a lot of pain that began on my left side where my tremors began and, and more of the stiffness were. Um, but then it became, you know, bilateral. And as a neurologist, you know, a specialist, pain and visual defects were not part of what we thought about with Parkinson's. So that's what really threw me and also threw a lot of the, you know, um, specialists, because although I began to have bladder dysfunction and I had a lot of restless legs and REM behavior and I had you know, more bradykinesia and balance problems and had some uh, rest tremors, although rest tremors have never been my, my biggest, I have a non-tremor dominant, more uh, akinetic, um, the vision and the pain were two symptoms that were so prominent and 
as a neurologist, as a physician, I knew that other things had to be rolled out first. So, you know, Beth started a two year journey of going to every doctor, trying to rule out everything. Uh, yes, I had dystonia and, you know, but so nobody was really thinking about Parkinson's because of those two symptoms. Uh, and it wasn't until after two years later with my bradykinesia got worse and my uh, tremors and my, um, you know, fatigue and, and bladder problems and balance issues and all of that uh, became worse that, you know, um, was more obvious that I obviously had a Parkinson's something, but still did not know what the vision and the pain symptoms were uh, until we started the treatment. We decided, you know, with, with my with my friend, uh, Dr. Sheesh, decided, you know, let's treat the Parkinson's, you have Parkinson's, and then we'll see. And lo and behold, to my um, amazement, uh, I could drive again. I wasn't running into things uh, and my pain almost diminished completely. And so I started doing research and I started thinking about my own patients, about women with Parkinson's and, and how they present. And I remember a few patients that had severe visual problems and I remember sending them to other you know, experts saying, is this related to Parkinson's? You know, and, and not really finding out an answer. And, and yes, it turns out it is part of it. So um, I think it started some new um, thinking about the disease and, and premotor and motor early symptoms and, and that is part of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know I've heard from a lot, maybe some people in the audience had the experience where they, you know, some of their symptoms wasn't in the literature as a classic symptom of Parkinson's um, and how unique in your situation you had the you know professional respect of the physicians you were working with you could go back to you know um, do research read journal articles um, and uh, instead of uh, I, I would imagine that your diagnosis probably uh, your diagnosis journey was it sounds like it was very difficult and slow but compared to someone without that training without those relationships um, it was sped up compared to, I don't know, maybe, maybe right. some I think that audience. if I didn't, I think that if I did not have the specialty, the, uh, the savvy, the knowledge that I had, it probably would have taken another five years at least till I became much more, I mean, really, uh, maybe even 10 years because it's really taken that long for the tremors to be more prominent, uh, although still very, very slight. Uh, and, you know, more of the bradykinesia and things. So I think it would have taken a lot longer uh, to get diagnosed and I would have continued to, to suffer and struggle if it had not been for that, uh, you know, for that initial knowledge and, and me really pursuing this and trying to get answers, which is what I recommend for everyone to try to uh, listen to your bodies, you know, your bodies and try to get answers uh, to, the, to the problems that you're having. Yes. I know there's there's been a lot of data collected on, especially with women. Women uh, go to their doctors, um, you know, say I'm having pain or I'm having this symptom, and not specific to Parkinson's, just health in general. And the data tells us that often it is not listened to that clinicians chalk it up to old age or, uh, you know, or, or who knows what they chalk it up to. Yeah. Um, can you tell us more about it? Because I think from, you know, reading some of your work, it's, uh, you know, women's health is a, a passionate area of yours. Yeah. No, it's true. Um, you know, I was, I was really, I had an eye opening experience because I Although I knew, and this is part of why I do what I do, my advocacy for women and, and minorities. And so, because I knew that, um, you know, women often get dismissed, uh, you know, as having either uh, women issues or, you know, being anxious or, you know, especially if you're a Latin woman, you know, they, they think that, oh, you're over exaggerating or that you're not uh, really uh, being forthcoming in your symptoms, especially when you have something as um subjective as pain you know where you can't really measure um how much and so 
my own colleagues, which was interesting, my own colleagues who, who trusted me as a physician, who referred thousands of patients to me, were now telling me, well, you know, maybe you're just depressed. Maybe you're just, you know, need a psychiatrist. Maybe you just need to go to a psychologist. Maybe, you know, quit thinking about that. Why would you have Parkinson's? You're 30 years old. You know, as if I had nothing, you know, no better imagination than to think, well, I see Parkinson's, so I'm going to have Parkinson's. And, you know, that's what they would tell me. And I was very uh, shocked and upset because, you know, here are people that on the one hand, they're saying, you know, they trust me as a professional, they trust me what I do. But yet when it comes to my own, uh, thinking of my own uh, illness, they were saying, you know, you don't have that. How can you have that? You know, let's focus on your patients. Your patients need you, you know, and yes, they need me, but there's something going on. And so that that was very, um, very interesting uh, to, to see that too two side, you know, as a doctor I was being trusted, but yet as a patient, I was being dismissed. And, and that was very, you know, um, that was very heartbreaking, especially when I was in the middle of, you know, after two years of being in severe pain and, and limiting my abilities because I was really beginning to, um, to interfere with my performance in my job, you know, because I was just hurting so much. I was becoming so irritable. I didn't want to be there. You know, I just wanted to get done, go home and, you know, kind of seclude myself in a dark, quiet place. So for somebody to just dismiss that, it was very, very heartbreaking. And so that was the first thing that my neurologist uh, said, you know, you look exhausted. I was, I was exhausted. I couldn't sleep. I was so fatigued uh, and in so much pain that, she could recognize that. She's known me for, you know, 20 years before that, you know, she's known me. And so she knows the kind of person, kind of doctor. And so she could tell that, you know, this was not, you know, the, the person that she knew. Uh, and so I really appreciated that, that she could understand and that, and that's why she made a point of saying, this is not what you think. It's not, it's in your brain, but not like you think. As I told her, I said, you know, if this is psychological, tell me. I mean, yes, my grandmother had died, my grandfather had died, you know, but I said, I don't think that that's what it is. I really do think that I have, but she's, I said, but if you tell me, you know, the mind is a powerful thing and sometimes it can mimic things. I said, but I trust you enough. If you tell me that I have a psychological issue, I will go get help if that's what it is. And that's why she made a point saying, well, it's not what you think. I mean, this is really a, you know, uh, a neurological disease. And of course, as soon as she started being medication, I mean, it was night and day. I was like, oh my God, you know, I've been, <laughs> you know, I realized what I've been missing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important. And I've read in a lot of your work and in hearing you speak, that's why you're passionate that people, like you even just said a few minutes ago, you know your body, advocate for yourself, find the right physician, find someone you have an, a great relationship with, you can communicate with, and don't settle, uh, you know, make sure your needs are addressed. So I think that's an important message for, for everyone on here. It's not that you have to go to medical school and then go to movement disorder fellowship in order to be listened to, um, you know, advocate for yourself. So. Right. And, th and that's the reason. And again, the, one of the reasons I do what I do is because if as a doctor, as a specialist, I had such a hard time getting diagnosed because I was young, because I was a female um, and I didn't have the typical, you know, symptoms, um, then it was up to me to try to educate and bridge that gap, uh, how we can improve diagnosis, how we can improve care uh, for, for the millions of people who have Parkinson's who may be young onset and who have not your typical, you know, uh, symptoms that perhaps more uh, idiopathic older people may, may, may present with. Mm -hmm. And pain is, you've mentioned pain specifically a couple times. So that's not, you know, on the traditional uh, list of symptoms. And I think you've been able to move the needle and, you know, prompt people to do more research into pain and Parkinson's, correct? Yes, yes. And, and again, you know, as a, as a Parkinson's patient, um, I'm used to treating pain in second, third, especially at end stage, you know, very, very painful as the muscles get very stiff. Uh, rigid. I mean, it can be so rigid, it can actually dislocate a shoulder, dislocate a hip, you know, so it's very, um, it's very severe and significant, and there's different types of pain. But we hadn't at that time really accepted or 
or thought of as pain as an initial symptom uh, of the Parkinson's, but it was something that obviously now, uh, you know, since I've been doing this almost, you know, more than 15 years, I have noticed that there is a significant, particularly in women, uh, tend to have more pain uh, than men, but younger onset more than older. And so that's one of the, the symptoms and there's different types of pain, but um, the pain that typically is seen with, with Parkinson's at young onset, uh, or rather early onset is more of a uh, central type of pain. It's not like a uh, herniated disc or it's not like a pull muscle, but rather it's coming from the brain directly. The, the ability to um, to sense your pain is like the threshold has been moved. And so now you're more sensitive to usual stimuli. So you become much more, you know, for me, showering was like pouring acid on my skin. That's how severe my pain was. Uh, and, uh, and so, of course, everybody was like, you know, it's got to be psychological, it's got to be, but, you know, I, I started medicine for Parkinson's, and I, thank God, I don't have that pain anymore, because I could not hold my, my three-year-old at the time, he couldn't bear any touch from anyone, it was so unbearing that I was just, you know, I was in tears all the time, because it was so painful, uh, so that, you know, that kind of devastation really wears on you after a while. Absolutely. No wonder you were exhausted. And I wanted to talk about empathy. Um, empathy. So when you were a practicing physician, um, did you, you said you, you know, turned away from neurosurgery because you liked being with people and, you know, uh, um, knowing them and speaking with them. Um, so would you call yourself an empathetic physician uh, when you were practicing? Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, that's why I think I was a very busy uh, practitioner because patients uh, like coming to me because I would listen to them. And even though I didn't always have the solutions or the answers, I would be honest with them, you know, let's look it up, let's find out, you know, what's going on. And just sometimes patients just need someone to listen, you know, not to offer solutions, but just someone to say, you know, I'm here for you. I'm going to listen. It's tough, you know, and, and they appreciated that having to coming over and, you know, sometimes they, they, they would love to get a hug and, you know, we were like family. So there was always, you know, that, that rapport. And once I, my grandmother had Parkinson's and she lived with me, then I started to, to kind of notice the, the difficulties more of the caregivers because I was going through them too. And I started to recognize in their faces that that complete exhaustion and, you know, and sometimes devastation and sometimes, you know, just fatigue, emotional, physical, you know, spiritual and 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 really started incorporating them more into the the care of the patient than I had before. Because always having somebody uh, somebody to care for you, uh, patients do much better than those that were just completely alone, had no family, no friend, you know, then uh, that was important. So yes, I could, I could see that and patients appreciated that. I would say, yes, you know, my grandmother is suffering the same thing. This is what I do for her. You know, this is the kind of thing. So it became much more of personal. And so they felt more at ease. And initially, I wasn't sure when I had the diagnosis that if they were going to stop coming to me, because maybe they would feel that, um, you know, that I was incompetent or something, but uh, they really opened up more because then they realized that, hey, I understood what they were going through. I could see from their, you know, uh, from my own personal opinion and perspective, what they were talking about. You know, it's one thing to have the knowledge, it's another thing to live it. Uh, that's, you know, that's a yeah. completely different thing, so. Yeah, that was gonna be, that also is something that I was curious about that, while you were, you know, before getting diagnosed, you know, you're such a caring and warm person and so personable and had relationships with your patients. But then once you were having symptoms, you were diagnosed and you were literally walking in people's shoes. Did that change how you talk to your patients and how you, you know, uh, worked with yes, them, what you prescribed? Definitely. Them? Definitely. I mean, I always try to make, you know, give them, you know, the 
the least amount of medicines that were going to make the most effect, you know, the least side effects that keep them more productive um, and, and, and do the testing that would be in a way that was not gonna be so invasive or so, um, you know, traumatizing or things like that. But I've come to realize that, you know, oftentimes the needs of a patient are completely different of the needs of the doctor and the way we are trained, the way we, we uh, what we value as important and what we value deem as lesser important. And I think I mentioned that sometimes, you know, I think that as a patient, we often become impatient because we are tired, we're hurting, we need answers now. And the typical, you know, way of doctors is, well, let's rule things out. It may take a week, it may take a month. You know, in that whole month, your patient is falling apart going, oh my God, am I gonna die? Am I gonna do this? How am I gonna get this test? You know, there's a million things going on. For the doctor, it's just like, oh yeah, we're gonna do this. And you know, it's a step, logical progression and we will get to it, but we don't realize the, the mental anguish that goes behind, you know, that. Uh, also, when we do tests, like, you know, I used to, order MRIs all the time. And, and it's funny because now that I've had about a million MRIs, not, not that many, but I've had a, a ton of MRIs, you know, initially it was like, yeah, no big deal. Now I get claustrophobic after all those, you know, it's like, do we really have to do it? So now it's like, okay, let's take some medicine. Let's, you know, we have, it takes a whole lot of preparation to go in to do an MRI than at the beginning, 20 years ago, when I was like, sure, I'll do an MRI, no problem. But when you do things so often, some things can develop, you know, kind of a phobia or an anxiety. And so those are things that, you know, we don't realize as patients, as doctors, you know, that when you, sure, we're going to have another MRI, sure, we're going to have another lumbar puncture, but, you know, you have to realize what that means to the patient. Uh, and also um, the things, like I said, that are important for patients, like the one thing that I've discovered, as I said earlier when I was talking to you, is this sweating, this uncontrollable sweating that, that comes one with autonomic dysfunction with the Parkinson's, but also some of the medications. And of course, being a woman, sometimes with perimenopause and menopause, you know? And, and patients would tell me, oh, I'm really sweating. And, the, the thing that I've always learned from every other, you know, when you train, oh yes, it's a side effect of cinnamon. Okay, it's a side effect of levodopa and just ended at that. But when you have to live with that kind of, you know, uh, discomfort, it becomes a different problem. You want help. You want to stop looking like a mad woman, you know, makeup running, you know, hair all dripping and, you know, clothes sticking and always having to change and things, you know, you don't, you don't feel well. So, you know, just saying that, oh yes, the medicine and not doing anything about it, it doesn't really help the patient. So, you know, doing something about it. So those are the kind of things that I've learned inside about, you know, or, oh, I get nauseous. Okay, yes, the medicine, take this other thing. But when you realize, okay, how bad is the nausea? Does it last five minutes? Does it last 24 hours? Is it a nausea that's like, eh, it's a little queasy and you can still do things, you, you know, in your day? Or is it the type that's gonna make you go to bed and be throwing up every five minutes? You know, those are the things that as a patient, I've learned that as a doctor, didn't have enough insight sometimes to say, hey, you know, how bad is the nausea? What do we have to do? You know, is it something that's really ruining your life? Or is it something that, eh, you know, you can deal with that and it's gonna get better. So those are the kind of things that, you know, I think that as a patient, I have learned to, to uh, appreciate and I can talk when I do my talks, talk about those, uh, those things, you know, from a personal, you know, level, both as a physician and a patient. Yeah, those specific examples are great. And many people were nodding about the sweating, but that should be something that, yeah, as a, a physician be like, oh yes, that is a, you know, that is the autonomic system yeah. function. But if you no, I can't wear things. I can't go places. I can't do what I want to do. It's affecting my quality of life. Um, so exactly to, be able to communicate that, that, oh, nausea is not a pesky side effect. No, right. I can't live my life because I'm, you know, vomiting or feel like I'm vomiting. So I think exactly. that you can't to travel. You can't do anything. Leave your house, you know, because you constantly feel like you're going to, or you do, you know, so that's a completely different scenario. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to your 
previous point about advocate for yourself, communicate. If your doctor brushes something off as, oh yes, that is a result of autonomic dysfunction. No, yeah, yes, I'm glad you understand what's happening in my body, but this is affecting my life. What, you know, let's keep talking about it. Right, how do I fix it? What do I do? How do I change it? Yes, that's, the, that's where the next level of communication is. Yes. And we had a question from Lauren, and you spoke in the video about the how women with Parkinson's, and the video spoke about, Dr. Dorsey mentioned the experience of women with Parkinson's, and the symptomology is different from, or can be different from men. Um, and you mentioned how, you know, your, your cycles affected things. So Lauren um, asked your thoughts on the role of estrogen in PD and whether it makes symptoms better or worse. Yeah, well, there's something that we're still uh, gathering information about that uh, because, you know, all the hormones, of course, dopamine affects the, the hormone cycle too. And so when you do replacement, you know, everything in our body and our brain is at constant equilibrium. So if you add something, something else goes down. So that's the thing we often forget that when we add more dopamine or we subtract something, then something else gets disarranged. So my, my thinking, even before I'm all, I had Parkinson's was always to try to maintain as much of a equilibrium as I could possibly with the treatments, medications, and so on. And the thing with estrogen is that we're not really sure um, if there's a window where it makes it better or makes it worse. Uh, and so that's the first thing that we have to realize, uh, whether it's something that is going to improve or is going to uh, worsen the Parkinson's. So I can't say at that point uh, as to, you know, increasing or decreasing or adding because we don't have enough information. Uh, we are gathering data. There's a lot of surveys. We're hoping to get some answers on that. And, and even when I talk to, I have talked to a lot of uh, gynecologists and, and women doctors about uh, perimenopause and menopause about, you know, what's good to replace? Is it, you know, estrogen and progesterone or just estrogen? Is it estrogen at low doses or estrogen at high doses? And I have gotten as many answers as I've had asked women. So there's no consensus. And so that's what I'm doing research right now, trying to figure out exactly what it is we need. We know that in other diseases like heart disease and Alzheimer's, um, you know, there's a window of that replacement before, you know, it improves. And if you miss that window, then it doesn't do anything. It may be even be detrimental. So that's where we are. However, I think that with the Parkinson's in women, young women with cycles, I think that we need to treat um, Parkinson's. And it's kind of catching on a little bit, but there's no, you know, tons of literature, but I've heard other movement disorders, they're involved in this women issues to kind of mention and agree with what I've been saying is that I think like uh, migraines that are uh, related to the cycle that you treat during the cycle. So if your symptoms are worse during the cycle, you would take larger doses of dopamine or something else. So that, I think that's where the consensus is gonna come, I think first, before we get to the point of where to add or not add hormones. Very good, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about, oh, there's another good question in the chat. Um, well, let me go back to Barbie's question in the chat. So she was wondering, what medications do you take? And do you, and this is my follow-up question, knowing Parkinson's and the medication uh, landscape, do you tell your doctor what you want? Like, what is that? Uh, do you describe yourself? How does that, what does that look like? What is that conversation like? Yes. Um, you know, it's funny because, as I said earlier, knowing things is different than living them and being with them. You know, I was an expert in knowing all the medicines, what they did, how they did it, uh, how they responded, and had an idea of how I wanted my uh, my treatment to go and it's something that I discuss all the time with my doctor but even knowing that it still was a 
a good year before I could find the right dose, the right combination, because I had so many side effects. And so, you know, uh, just because I knew there were good medicines, I knew how they worked, I knew what the side effects didn't mean that my body agreed, you know, with that kind of, you know, dosing or that kind of symptoms. I mean, I had the usual falling asleep with the Mirapex. I had the usual hallucinations with Requip, you know, I had the usual orthostatic symptoms with the cinnamon, you know, so I've had all those things. So I knew and I was prepared. I mean, I knew how to work around them because again, that's what I did. Uh, and so we worked, but it still was, you know, it took about a year to get me where I was able to function uh, in a positive manner, you know, with the medications without all the side effects. Uh, and so I always ask patients, and I know, again, as a patient, that's why I said we get impatient. We want, when we feel bad, we want to have answers. We want the pill to be given to us to work immediately and to make us all better. But we're also different. Uh, one, our bodies tolerate medicines differently. Also, our age matters uh, because medicine sometimes that may be able to work uh, when we're younger may not work when we're older or vice versa. Uh, other, oh, another thing that's very important is also the combination of medicines because I have found in my patients and in myself that it's not particularly sometimes the one medicine that pushes me over the edge, but it's the combination. And so when we alter the combination, I have no problem with whatever medicine. And so don't be afraid to try different combinations, to try same medicines. As long as you didn't have an allergic reaction, be flexible to trying the same medicines again, because the combination or the dosage or your state of you know, your health at that time is different. So that's the one thing that I've learned. Um, I have, my treatment has been just as I would treat my patients, a little bit of everything to try to maintain the balance. Uh, I take Acelic, I take um, Nupro Patch, I take uh, Ritari, um, I take Amantadine, and I've taken, recently I've added the new medicine, um, Ogentis, or Progentis, which is the long acting content. Uh, when I first started um, taking Ritari, which was already, I don't know, seven years, six years ago, at least, whenever it came out, um, it was night and day. I mean, I was back to myself, you know, things that I didn't even realize were a problem, uh, like listening to music and reading. I stopped, you know, enjoying those things. And so when I took that, I realized how much dopamine our brain needs for different activities. Um, and so that's, you know, you must have dopamine always, but you can regulate the amount of dopamine by different medications you take alongside with it uh, and also decrease your dyskinesias. Well, over the years, my retari used to last, uh, one dose used to last about, you know, up to 12 hours. And over the years now it's gone, it had gone down to about four to five hours. Um, and so when I added this, um, this Ogentis, which is a long acting, it's gone back up to seven hours. So, you know, it's like, it's about playing with medicines. And how do I talk to my doctor? Uh, you know, I tell her, of course, what we're going through, you know, my symptoms and, you know, and then we talk about, you know, what's new, what haven't I tried, what can we do? And, and we talk about it and we talk about, you know, well, I had problems with that, that side effect, or, you know, maybe that's not, you know, I'm having this problem too, or I have other medical issues and, you know, is that gonna interfere? You know, but always, you know, what else is there to do and how can we, one, minimize the amount of drugs because, you know, taking drugs every two hours, every three hours is not a way to live, okay? Uh, I've been there and I don't know how I ever did that to my patients and I apologize to my patients because it's awful to always be looking for your medicines. I, I maintain my medicines to about four times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime. I've always, after 15 years, still maintaining it. Uh, and again, by different things, if you can. Uh, of course, you know, somebody may have to do it, but, but really minimizing the, the number of times you have to take medicines because that really impacts your life. Uh, and the other thing is, again, after all these years, now I'm beginning to think she gave me this new medicine and I said, how much is it? it was the first time I ever asked that. 
because, you know, after so many medicines and so many pills and fighting with insurance and so much, you know, you get to a point of like, oh my God, am I going to have to fight for this one too? How much is it going to be? Am I going to be able to afford it? So, you know, and it's something like she told me just like I would have said, I don't know, you know, it's, it's a great medicine. It works great. But, you know, on the patient side, it's like, well, am I going to have to spend another three days arguing with my pharmacy or, you know, my insurance? So those are the things that as a patient I've learned. And to ask about, you know, samples, ask about assistance programs, ask about, you know, those kind of things. Yes, and that's so true to hear, you know, so when you're not doing it, to hear uh, that someone's taking medication every two hours, you know, you can kind of put yourself in someone's shoes and imagine and empathize that, oh, that does, that's a lot that you must be, you know, chained to the clock and all of that but how different then to live it and know exactly what is entailed exactly what you can't do how that affects your life and how to communicate that so that everyone uh for all the folks who are not that dual role like you um how do we someone put in the chat yeah how do um, how do doctors learn what is taught? Um, how do we work towards more, you know, physician empathy and, and communication? It's, it's from you, the patient saying, you know, telling the doctors, you know, this medicine works, but, you know, can I, you know, my life, I can't live by my clock. You know, I still, we have a life outside of Parkinson's. We can't be tied to our medicines and our clock. You know, can we find a way to make it less often? And, and you know, back when I trained, I mean, we had a handful of medicines, so we had no option. You know, that's what we did because that's all we had. But now, 20 years later, I mean, we have so many treatments that I don't think anybody really should be tied to taking medicines every two hours because there's so many alternatives and options and you should talk to your doctors about how to make that better for you. And you mentioned in the in the video clip, it talked also about access to those medications. So I agree with you. It is a shame that their research has come up with new medication options. And yet because of insurance, because of financial costs, like Lori said, so many are out of reach due to cost. Yeah, and I'm working with a foundation, a Gira Foundation, just for that. Is they work on neurological diseases, and I'm working with them with Parkinson's. About uh, so many foundations are um, collecting resources for research, which is which we need. I'm not saying not discarding that, but we need the here and now. Patients need help here and now with their treatments, with their medications, with their you know uh, ability to live day to day life. And so they are, they are committed to finding ways to bring resources to patients to help with these problems because it doesn't matter we have 30 new medicines if nobody's using them. You know, if nobody's able to take advantage of them, only a handful is able to do it. So that's what I'm working on with, with them and working with other companies because we need to be able to have access for better lives, you know, uh, for better quality of life. That's what it's about. And it was the Agira? Adira, yes, Adira Foundation, yeah. Well, uh, we're coming to the top of the hour, so I wanted to close with what might be a controversial statement. Uh, there's already been some chat back and forth. You know, you mentioned in the video clip, and um, uh, and people have been talking in the chat that is you've been able to see your diagnosis uh, of Parkinson's in a positive light. You've been able to see um, some positive things that have transpired out of it. There's some people in the chat, my friend Roger, who is the world's biggest optimist. Um, but I, I wanna call out that this diagnosis, this di disease, at many times can feel like anything but a blessing and those words can hurt. And I wanna call that out, but give you the chance to address why, you know, perhaps you make that, that very powerful statement. 
Yes, I, I absolutely agree. And don't, don't think for a second that because I say it's been a blessing in disguise that I think that every moment of every second of my life with Parkinson's has been a walk in the park. Okay, I have had many cries. I have had many desperate moments. I have been suicidal. I have been, uh, you know, at my wit's end, uh, thinking that, you know, is this really worth, you know, going like this? Um, and, you know, fortunately, one is my faith that keeps me going, is the belief that there's something better out there, something greater, something higher than me, and that everything happens for a reason. Uh, and that, you know, me having spent 30 years to become a doctor, <laughs> to then, you know, live this disease, uh, you know, had a positive, you know, that, had, that I could help people. Um, and, and it is hard. And I'm not saying that don't, uh, don't underestimate your emotions and don't deny your emotions. If you feel like crying, if you feel like, uh, you know, screaming and yelling and that, do it. Uh, we all human, we all feel that way. But what I'm saying is that after you do that, put yourself together and get up. Get up that there's something better. Find that passion, that reason for living, that purpose. Find what makes you happy, what keeps you going, whether it's your family, your pets, you know, whatever it is. Find that and find a way to get up because that positivity is what reinforcing the positivity, one, is going to release a lot of dopamine, a lot of serotonin, so you're going to feel better, uh, but also is going to, in the end, have a better quality of life. And if you don't feel that way, talk to your doctors, talk to, you know, your psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, pastors, whoever, friends, you know, I always say you should have at least three people to, one, you can cry with, one you can laugh with, and one you can talk to, you know, so when you feel like, you know, I'm at my wit's end, you know who to call, have somebody, okay, uh, have somebody to just listen, to be there. Oftentimes, you know, I'm very blessed that, and it taken time because, you know, being a very independent uh, doctor and very always a caregiver, it took time to accept that I needed help too, that I needed also somebody to be there for me. I couldn't always be the one given help. Uh, and to open up and say, you know, I'm just not feeling well today. You know, today I feel really lousy. Today I feel kind of sad and depressed. You know, I feel like, um, you know, I'm just not wanting to to get up you know and do things or i'm wondering like what's my future gonna hold um so have those friends say hey come over i don't want to go out or i'm too sick to go out come over sit with me you have to talk have some coffee have coke and then before you know it you know if you have that kind of report even if you want to come over in pjs you know we'll do a pj party you know and then before you know it you start feeling better i mean that's usually my advice uh the other thing that i I would advise people is knowing the difference between depression and apathy. Okay, we often get that confused and it's not the same thing. Depression is something that you feel blue, you feel sad, you have lost interest in any passion of life, anything that you love to do before, whether it was you know your children, your husband, painting, whatever, you don't find the fun of it anymore, okay? You don't want to do it. And usually depression, yes, you can have a day that's blue. And some days I wake up mad at the world. Some days I wake up sad at the world. But, you know, it lasts a day or two. But if it's lasting a week, two weeks, six weeks, that's chronic depression. You need to be seeking help, seeking medical help. The other is apathy, which people com confuse with depression. Apathy is where you have an interest, you want to relate to the world, you want to go out with your friends, you want to do the things, but you don't have the drive, the energy. It takes too much energy to do it, okay? So that's very different. And that's a dopamine problem. That is one, the serotonin is the, the depression. This is a dopamine problem where, you just, you know, it takes too much effort to get dressed. It takes too much effort to shower. 
And it's not because you don't think you should shower. It's not because you don't want to shower. It's not because you don't think you should get dressed, but it's like, why? Nobody's going to come visit. I'm not going anywhere. So that equilibrium of reward and, and pleasure is like, eh, why do it if I'm not really going to do anything, right? And that's very different. That's apathy. Like, you know, I'm not really, I want to go out with my friends, but you know, that energy to get dressed, put on my makeup, drive, it just takes too much. So I don't want to go out. But, you know, oftentimes I've recognized that that's an apathy. One, we need more dopamine. We need to talk to our doctors. And two, say, hey, you know, I just can't get going. Can you pick me up? Can you come and, you know, help me, you know, be here, dress, whatever, not dress, but, you know, give me incentive, you know, something fun we're going to do. So that changes your perspective. And you will see why so many people tell me, you know, why is it when my spouse is home, he just sits there, doesn't do anything, she doesn't do anything, doesn't get dressed, and then suddenly people come over or they go out and they're happy and they're talking and they're walking. Is that incentive? Is that reward? Is that lack of drive? Is that dopamine? That's why everybody needs to be on dopamine. And so if you can understand the two differences, I think your life will be so much better. Uh, I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing, just, you know, understanding that for yourself. Such a good practical tip from someone who has lived it and studied it and all of the different perspectives. So thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for, yeah, just being a part of this community. It's uh, as it was shared in the film, we are really lucky to, to have you. Well, so you. yes, we, um, uh, we always like to close with a goodbye wave. So I invite everyone to turn on your camera and, and wave at Maria to, to say thank you. We're in this together and scroll through. It's always my favorite yeah. part to see everyone's uh, smiling faces. Yeah, sometimes it takes one second at a time, one breath at a time to keep going. Don't give up. Love it. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone, and a great weekend. Bye Thank bye you now. so much. God bless you. And uh, I look forward to meeting you guys sometime. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.